and welcome to the AAU TV Midweek News and we are coming to you from the headquarters of the Association of African Universities in Accra, Ghana. My name is Lydia Nyame. With me are Jimang Madalada Mdochi. And my name is Ajiman Otredako. And now the headlines on higher education. Free education for disabled students to be implemented. And again, lack of quality assurance affects employment opportunities. And in our health news, one cup of leafy green vegetable a day lowers risk of heart disease. And also female lawyers more likely to report stress, risky drinking than male lawyers. And our technology news, Egypt enhances COVID-19 treatment with robotic hospital assistants. We're glad you made time to watch the AAT Midweek News. Don't go anywhere. We'll bring you more of health, higher education and tech news. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to GTP Health and Safety Corner. If you feel like stepping out, remember social distancing. You might just save a life. Rock at home, stay at home, stay safe. Wash your hands with soap and the running water. Spaced out but still in touch. Check in on your loved ones and stay safe. GTP Timeless back from the break and Zimbabwe's government has implemented a policy to provide free education for university students and students at secondary and primary level who live with disabilities. A new government department has been created to ensure the smooth implementation of policy amidst plans to ensure that it is decentralized so students across the country benefit. Most disabled students come from poor families and a lack of funds prevents them from having access to education. But the new policy is dealing with this challenge. The latest development comes at a time when institutions of higher learning in Zimbabwe hiked fees, placing higher education beyond the reach of many young people. Student unions have since petitioned parliament over the fees hikes. Lavmore Matuke, the Deputy Minister of Public Service, Labour and Social Welfare, said those living with disabilities who want to benefit must apply to his ministry and the government will settle their fees. Funds have already been budgeted for this purpose. We are saying those living with disabilities can go from grade 1 to university for free. Disability comes in two ways. There are those who can afford fees and there are those who are vulnerable. So, those who cannot afford to pay can come to our offices and apply, and government can pay. Government is indeed taking care of the fees, he said. Well, great news coming from Zimbabwe, and kudos to the Zimbabwe government. But, you know, most often than not, persons with disabilities do not enroll in schools. Could the cost of education be a cost? Um, I would say the cost of education can be one of the causes, but, you know, we can talk about inferiority complex mm -hmm. as one of the causes. Education itself in Africa, I would say, is expensive. Yeah. Looking at Africa's um, population of 40% being poor. Mm -hmm. And also the article made um, a statement as, you know, those disabled people uh, mostly come from the poor family. Mm -hmm. So taking it from that point, for even though a mother would want um, his or her disabled child to go to school and also complete to be successful as any other child, he or she would rather use that money, which is for education, for the, um, the daughters or the, ch uh, the son's mm -hmm. mental and um, their health. Yeah. And, you know, this makes it so, um, you know, so... Um, challenging that yeah. the money that is supposed to use to be used for schooling is now being used for their medical health yeah. because when you're not medically sound you can't go to school mm -hmm. but notwithstanding that i know the university of ghana has disabled students who mm -hmm. are schooling and are yeah. doing well for themselves so i would say money or cost of education is not solely the cause there are other things that prevent this disabled children to go to school. Okay, I think regardless of the cost of education, the SDG goal number four makes it clear that there should be quality education for all. For all. And SDG goal 10 was talked about the, the, the effort to reduce inequalities. Mm -hmm. We find the state of disabled students in Zimbabwe a peculiar one in this case, whereby they have not been able to make it to school 
to primary, senior high school, and also university because of their situation. Mm -hmm. Jamal uh, mentioned that theoretical complex was what part. Uh, maybe that is very important. You look down yourself because you think you uh, you look differently, you act mm -hmm. differently exactly. compared to other normal people, yes. so to say, and therefore you can't go to school. But beyond that, I think it's a very great move that is the government to assure that students of this kind are given the room to go to school for free. But there is a problem. Mm -hmm. According to the Minister of Higher Education Technology, um, Honorable Moriwa, mentioned that there are some exclusions. Mm -hmm. Students who are deaf, so to say, uh, I would say, yeah. um, speech impaired, yes. are not part of it, which I think that is a bit of more of a discrimination because mm -hmm. these are all impairments, uh, visually impaired, really yeah. impaired, mm -hmm. physically challenged, yeah. it's all impairment. So if you are providing free education access to these people, why then do you want to now drop deaf students because sure. you think theirs is quite unique than others? I think they all need a equal opportunity to also advance in such free yeah. education. Yeah, that's, that's very, very true. Now, you know, persons with disabilities are considered bad omen in African society. Therefore, they are denied quality education, quality health care, and quality educational facilities. But I want to find out why society has that perception about people with disabilities. You know, the common perception of people with disabilities as bad omen is mostly found in developing countries, let me say in Africa, okay? And it's mostly a cultural or an ancestral belief that, you know, that child has actually committed a crime to, you know, their gods or um, the child is actually suffering from a sin that has been committed by their ancestor or by their parents. But, um, you know, all these things, you know, have a way or let me say at uh, the cultural or our beliefs as our tradition um actually poses that is the culture and beliefs our tradition poses to us as perception of children who are being mm -hmm. disabled mm -hmm. i think it's unfortunate well we've had enough of all these taboo superstitions and myths that exactly. impede on the success of good for economy yeah. mm -hmm. if you are in the 21st century and you still bear the thought that a disabled or a physically challenged person is of as a witch as a witch or mm -hmm. as a wizard or perhaps as a bad old man mm -hmm. then you can't prove it how can you prove it exactly. this time we need to be able to prove whatever that happens to us exactly. i can prove medically that someone ends up being physically challenged because of some genotype mismatch mm -hmm. that okay. end up bringing the person in that form exactly. but can you prove what makes a person a witch or perhaps made a person a bad omen mm -hmm. these are more that thought that we must do away with exactly. in our in, in where we are now the direction that africa wants to move it is unity and togetherness exactly. to achieve exactly. a goal i think such divisions and setbacks marginalizations do not really help us to really become the Africa we want. Exactly. You know, as it stands now, the total population of Zimbabwe is 15 million. Mm -hmm. And then out of the 15 million, persons with disability constitute 7% of that 15 million. Exactly. Which basically means they are about 4.6 million. 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 And if society tells us that these 4.6 million mm -hmm. people are people with bad omen, Come on, society can do better than exactly. that. Exactly. Like, I, I think I'll agree with Jemima when she says she would blame it on our cultural beliefs. Exactly. And I mean, I, I, we've allowed those beliefs overcloud our judgment and we are making yeah. a lot of bad and decisions. Lydia, let me just add this to it, okay? According to the study, we realize that uh, as of the moment, mm -hmm. Zimbabwean higher education system has been able to allow less than 400 students mm -hmm. to pass through higher education. I mean, mostly uh, disabled students. Yeah. And that is the problem. So looking at this figure of students who will be able to go this far, I think they, there's, there's more they can do. Exactly. Out of 7 million or 4.6 million, there is less than 400 students who are able to pass through their middle and higher education. Mm -hmm. They can do better. Exactly. Com yeah, compared to Ghana, free senior high school, which okay. is open for okay. every student, yeah. that not disabled, whoever you are, exactly. not rich or poor, mm -hmm. everyone is under the basket mm -hmm. of free senior high. Mm -hmm. Why is it like this? Is in okay. I think they can do better in terms of expanding the policy. Okay, you know, wh when you say you think they can do better, I want to find out how exactly can we alleviate this belief? Um, I think there should be discriminatory laws and policies, you know, um, those who are disabled actually have some, you know, 
they just feel they just don't feel that sense of belonging before because they feel they are different they behave their body this part is like this so i think there are policies that should you know bridge that gap of they feeling like they are outskirts mm -hmm. or they are outside mm -hmm. of the community or they are not being considered exactly. yeah notwithstanding the non-discriminatory laws that uh, joma has asked that perhaps should be implemented in zimbabwe we should also look forward to understand that this is Africa. Mm -hmm. This is our people. They are part of us. And they are who they are as a result of medical reasons, exactly. not because of spiritual, um, supernatural, or exactly. superficial means. Yeah. These are people we have procreated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we must care for them the best way we can. They have the right to education, mm -hmm. the right to life. And every basic right that every human being enjoys on earth, exactly. they are also part of it. Exactly. And therefore, we must embrace them exactly. and grow with them. Sure, therefore, we must embrace them and grow with them. But I, I, I so must commend the Zimbabwe government for putting up this initiative. Now, still on higher education, according to a government audit report, low-quality assurance mechanisms are to blame for the deteriorating standards of university education in Tanzania after the country embarked on a fast expansion of higher education. According to the report by the country's controller and auditor general, presented to Tanzania President Samia Suhulu Hassan, indicates that the country's graduates' competitiveness has been hampered by poor and outdated quality assurance mechanisms. We found out that some students and universities have not conducted a review of quality control to adapt them to dynamic new teaching trends and have no report on quality assurance. Others had no policies, regulations, or program work in quality control, Chikura said in the report that has been tabled in Parliament. Even where universities had developed quality assurance tools, such as Mzube University, Adhi University in Dar es Salaam, and the University of Dar es Salaam, the report said, such practices were outdated and unable to support proper quality controls, especially in research fields. The audit report added that the Tanzania Ministry of Education, Science and Technology Quality Assurance Mechanism was weak and limited. The report said the ministry lacked. These challenges of weak quality assurance systems have led to continued production of weak graduates without the necessary skills to compete in the job market, said Kicheri. The report recommended that government employ more trained inspectors to carry out frequent assessments to ensure higher education quality. Other that, better infrastructure facility better teachings, improves student outcomes and reduces the number of dropouts. Well, there we have it, issues of concern in Tanzania higher education. But I want to find out in what ways does lack of quality assurance in universities impact graduate unemployment? You know, just I'll say just like a product in the market, when you don't know the quality of the product, you don't buy it. Exactly. And you know, one one main goal of our universities is to provide graduates who will help solve problems in our communities. Mm -hmm. But the system to check the quality of our graduates, you know, is not as effective as yeah. it should be. Yeah. And employers in the organizations are looking at um graduates who fit into their work mm -hmm. where these graduates are also not equipped enough to actually fit in but i think if these institutions or if our institutions will have or will bring in the quality check of our graduates mm -hmm. i think there's problems of this problems that organization face as graduates not being able to fit in well would actually reduce okay Ajaman. yeah basically we are looking at quality assurance as a preventive and proactive tool mm -hmm. to ensure that some things that were some lapses or some gaps in a system which is continuously in motion would be changed to make it much more efficient and effective. Okay. If it doesn't get better after quality assurance, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. So anytime we run a quality assurance check, we wish to know what and what are causing things not to go the way that you go. Mm -hmm. You remember back in school, basically there can be a form sent to every student at the end of every semester that you should assess your lecturer, mm -hmm, assess mm -hmm. the lessons, yes. assess your performance. Exactly. Yeah. And the quality assurance directory will need that information keenly because they want to know if they are doing better mm -hmm. in terms of teaching uh, 
skills, the pedagogy, the curricula, the effectiveness of the course. Okay. Because we need to know if we're doing better or not so we can see if we can grow. Mm -hmm. Continuous development is a part of the institution's goals. Exactly. And that is why quality assurance cannot be detached from, quality, uh, from higher education, mm -hmm. growth and effectiveness. Okay. Basically. But, but what, what does quality assurance in this sense entails? So we're looking at the quality of the institution in terms of their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You saw that in, uh, in Tanzania, we're looking at the physical infrastructure. Do you have room okay. to educate people? Mm -hmm. Do you have the facilities, the equipment, state of the art mm -hmm. uh, facilities to ensure that people will not only come and read books, mm -hmm. but will also come and feel the systems they'll be working with, okay. information technology systems, which mm -hmm. are now inevitable in our way of life. Mm -hmm. We're looking at quality human resources who are up to date with very novel and innovative teaching pedagogy. These are mm -hmm. all part of it. And more importantly, the curricula that we're working okay. with. It is the, the chain mail that we all pass with the curricula. Mm -hmm. The curricula should be in tune with reality, current enough to make everyone feel that they are in tune with society, mm -hmm. technology-wise. Because that's what digitization is all over the place. If the curricula does not embrace digitization mm -hmm. and creativity, then it's outmoded. Okay. You know, many universities in Africa lack laboratories or necessary in that industry linkages where we can go and have practical lessons, therefore denying students upper hand in the labor market. Do universities encourage industry linkages? I would say um, university industry linkages actually help in employment, or let me say employability. And some universities and industries actually um, encourage linkages. Okay. And mostly this is done through internship programs and service programs. Yeah. Where, for instance, let me not say for instance, the AAU as in the Association of African Universities, I remember in 2019, opened its doors for students or let me say graduates from different universities to actually come in and have a three-month program. So I think some institutions and um, institutions and organizations actually you, you know, promote it. You know, you know, to just, I don't know, but I, I kind of seem to have something that contradicts what you're saying. Because okay. yes, uh, students from various institutions go to other industries to have their internship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the question is, are they at industries or organization that is in line with what they are studying in school? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. But what I know is what what I know sometimes the AAU does, or let me say students do. Uh, let me say no, those who post students do is that they actually not for all students, but sometimes they look at your course and give you an organization or an institution that links with yours. And sometimes I know it's really different. Okay. It's just something else. Okay. I yeah, you know, there are some values and some skills that university can help you to develop. Mm -hmm. Some day which they cannot. Exactly. When it comes to the hard skills, which are the very curricular content based skills you can develop. Mm -hmm. We can you can have a university that has all the systems, like some big universities who have their laboratories, mm -hmm. have everything you need, every equipment that you need to help you enhance your practicality of the lesson. Then we've got something that they can't do. So mm -hmm. perhaps they give you that uh, corporate feel. Mm -hmm. That is where the industry linkages come in. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have departments like the, uh, the industrial relations department. Mm -hmm. What their role is, they are resource to ensure that they broker partnership with uh, in big industry players, mm -hmm. organizations, to provide them slots, mm -hmm. uh, sign MOU. So when mm -hmm. it's time, you can come for your letter and then you go start your okay. internship to gather the skills. These are done and more, but there's more to be done. Actually, mm -hmm. you were, you were trying to just bring mm -hmm. on board. There's more to be done in terms of ensuring that there's more particularity in campus and out oh, campus. campus. Because some students can go to the work environment, mm -hmm. but you have no idea what they do over what there. They do. Are they even allowed to use the machines or even get that particularity? It's true. Mm -hmm. They are some, some because are made, I mean, in Ghana here, students do go have internships that organizations and basically all they do is they are being sent to get water mm -hmm. to get food Lunch. for three months they exactly. waste transportation and not learn anything mm -hmm. yeah some are underestimated because you are just an intern what exactly. do you think what, what, do what can you, you do what can you do exactly. so university should even though they have been able to broker that partnerships they should also do as much as possible that what they do out there can be done in a way 
in campus. Well, you know, this, this leads me to my next question. Are students given the practical feel of what they study in school? Well, practicality is, is, is very important to every field of study. Mm -hmm. And that is where the intentions come in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help you get more of the practicality, the experience. What about the you. role the school plays in ensuring that you have it on campus? Well, as I said, some universities can't even afford to exactly. acquire all that you need to, to help field. you expand mm -hmm. your experience. But all we need to do is just, there's something to be do, one ensure that we strengthen our ties with the industry mm -hmm. so we can have more rooms for practicality. Mm -hmm. Second of all, we can also conduct uh, graduate traces. For example, a university can track their graduates. Mm -hmm. Okay, they are big industry players. Mm -hmm. They are from our institution. Okay. They should, because they're from our institution, we believe that they would not allow their, their students or people who are from their school to be doing other many things, but rather focus on getting their particular, particular experience. Okay. And okay. therefore, mm -hmm. we trust in that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the normal one, encourage students to do internships and be serious with it. So that at least when they go, and if you want to go, you should to go and buy water and food. Well, but insist that you have a feel of, of the real work. Well, students must insist to have a feel of the real working environment. Health News is up next. So in our health news today, new research has found that by eating just one cup of nitrate-rich vegetable each day, people can significantly reduce their risk of heart diseases. Research has found that by eating just one cup of nitrate-rich vegetables each day, people can significantly reduce their risk of heart diseases. The study investigated whether people who regularly ate higher quantities of nitrate-rich vegetables such as leafy greens and beetroot had lower blood pressure and it also examined whether these same people were less likely to be diagnosed with heart disease many years later. Cardiovascular diseases are the number one cause of death globally taking around 17.9 million lives each year. Researchers examined data from over 50,000 people residing in Denmark taking part in the Danish diet, cancer and health study over a 23-year period. They found that people who consumed the most nitrate-rich vegetables had about a 2.5 lower systolic blood pressure and between 12 to 26 percent lower risk of heart diseases. This is interesting, but... You know, I would want us to talk about some of, our, some of the nitrate-rich vegetables and boil it down to our local nitrate-rich vegetables. Well, you know, first of all, I'd like to say that green leafy vegetables play a very vital role in a healthy diet and, of course, in a healthy life. Okay. Vegetables that are particularly rich in nitrate include. Exactly. I mean, we saw it in the video. Exactly. There's lettuce, there's spinach, there's parsley, there's cabbage. There, mm -hmm. there are a lot of it. But my, the little problem I have with it is the fact that some of these vegetables are not really common on the market. Mm -hmm. An example is a spinach, parsley. These exactly. are these are items that you, you wouldn't find on the normal markets that we go by for uh, vegetables like lettuce, for cabbage, cabbage. and even contumery. Mm -hmm. We can th those are all parts we can find them on the market. On the so market. we should focus on getting the ones that are available mm -hmm. in the market because it really helps in reducing. Heart diseases, heart diseases, as the city says. Exactly, Ajuman. You know, Lydia has mentioned the fact that these should be available. And I'm asking myself, whose role is it to ensure that we have adequate amount of cabbage or high nitrate vegetables on the, the market? market? Our soils are, are viable enough to, to grow these. Mm -hmm. days. We exactly. grow lettuce in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have lettuce, uh, spinach, all these vegetables are grown in Ghana. Oh, yeah. But only are sold on the modern market. Mm -hmm. You can't find them on the local market. Oh, no. I mean, there's something we should for break. For lettuce, you do find Yeah, them for lettuce. Well, I'm, just, I'm just market. about the quantity. How, how much of it do you find in the local market? Out. It's not easy. And even the affordability of it. Something exactly. we can grow in our own country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's important that we ensure that we make it available, not only for the heart, but exactly. only for the mind. You know, a good heart is a good mind. Mm -hmm. So, this these same high nitrate vegetables work well for our minds in retention and also how sharp they are of so course. we don't get That's dementia. True. In the same way for our, our heart diseases, we floor so many people in our country due to hypertension or heart disorders. Mm -hmm. Today, we are trying to encourage that we should do well, our farmers do well. If it's other uh, 
means or the sort of value chain which will ensure that we have exactly. enough yes. of this high nitrate vegetables on our market so we can stay healthy okay so we should have enough and stay healthy moving on work related factors impact the high rate of stress risky drinking and nutrition in lawyers differently depending on gender according to a new study Recent national report indicates lawyers suffer from especially high rates of depression, anxiety and substance misuse, as well as high rates of attrition, particularly among women. In a study, 2,863 men and women currently working in law responded to the survey with women making up to 51% of the final sample. Overall, the results showed men and women differ with respect to both the prevalence of these problems, that is stress, substance misuse and attrition, as well as the degree to which workplace factors contributed to the problem. 67% of the sample reported working over 40 hours per week and nearly 25% reported working over 51 hours per week on average. Younger attorneys were two to four times more likely than their older colleagues to report moderate or high stress. High work overcommitted with associated with stress for both men and women, but this relationship was stronger for women. 30% of respondents screened positive for high risk hazardous drinking and a significantly greater proportion of women compared to men engaged in risky drinking and high risk drinking. You know, I find the story quite interesting looking at how one's profession as a lawyer goes a long way to introduce some health hazards. But my question is, what can we identify in the work-related factors of a lawyer that may be linked to stress, anxiety, and the depression they face? Okay, you know, I'll come to that. But before then, I want to state that mm -hmm. statistics indicate that lawyers are 3.6 times as likely to be depressed as compared to people uh, from other professions. professions. And it gets worse if the lawyer is a female because you'd have to combine all that stress and depression to being a mother, being a, a wife. wife. I mean, for women, mm -hmm. it, it, it is a lot. But I also want to state that the efficacy of a lawyer is first of all measured by the knowledge he or she, she possesses. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is not picked on a silver platter. You need to work for it. It entails endless research. And trust me, if you spend your entire day, your entire week, your entire month and years, spend, uh, uh, sorry, uh, your entire day, month and whatever on research, exactly. you get stressed. Mm -hmm. Because here's the case, you are being pressured to possess knowledge because without exactly. it, you are irrelevant. Exactly. Without it, society doesn't regard you. Mm -hmm. And another cause is the fact that clients put a lot of pressure on lawyers. Yeah. Exactly. They put a lot of pre pressure on them because they need them to win. win the yeah. So if you have people pushing you that much, you end up getting stressed. stressed. Sure. I mean, this is a very laborious profession, you know? it, even though it's rewarded. You, know? mm -hmm. yeah, you see lawyers dressed uh, with their color and their, mm -hmm. ga their, their gown and all that. Mm -hmm. You just, so much with the admiration. I admire female lawyers, all right? Uh, okay. Today I realized that uh, there's a whole lot behind um, the female lawyer that mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Regards to that long hours of research mm -hmm. and inquiry into information mm -hmm. to defend a client or pass for, to prosecute someone. All of these go into it. And at the end of the day, if they don't get that kind of support mm -hmm. they need, that kind of help they need in their relationships mm -hmm. and, their, and their work, perhaps they break down. Exactly. So me being left alone in this, in this situation, working for the good of others, but you have nobody to help support help you, you mm -hmm. with what you have to do. I think this is enough to break you down, make you depressed, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, you're, you're gullible to all sort of um, misuse mm -hmm. and, and, and vices. All right, so that is all for health news. Let's go for a quick break, and when we come, we'll give you technology news. Welcome to GTP Health and Safety Corner. If you feel like stepping out, remember social distancing. You might just save a life. Rock at home, stay at home, stay safe. Wash your hands with soap under running water. Spaced out but still in touch. Check in on your loved ones and stay safe. GTP Timeless. 
Welcome back and there's the tech news and with Egypt facing a second coronavirus wave, mechatronics engineer Mahmoud El Kumi is currently carrying out trials on a self-funded prototype for remote control robots to assist physicians in running tests on suspected COVID-19 patients. See, uh, African News brings up more reports. With Egypt facing a second coronavirus wave, mechatronics engineer Mahmoud El Kumi trials a self-funded prototype for a remote-controlled robot to assist physicians in running tests on suspected COVID-19 patients in a bid to limit human exposure to disease carriers at a private hospital in Tanta. Before starting its mission, the robot receives training to improve its artificial intelligence. The training is done by a specialist doctor. The AI in this training acts like a human doctor. The robot, called Sira 3 sports a human-like face and head to put patients at ease and can carry out an array of medical procedures and display the results to patients on a screen attached to its chest. The AI has also been developed to perform pain-free PCR swab tests. This robot is specially designed to help the medical staff during COVID-19 times. It is a medical robot capable of multitasks. It can deal with patients in their beds, chest scans, fever screening, and face mask detection. Face mask addiction. Mahmoud El Komi reports positive feedback from patients. The North African nation reports just under 200,000 confirmed coronavirus cases, with over 150,000 recoveries, according to the WHO. There we have it, a uh, robotic medical assistant. And I want to find out what is the medical impact of this solution in times like this, COVID-19 and beyond. Well, I personally think robots would reduce the number of uh, number of doctors and nurses who contract COVID in their line of action. You know, robots are going to serve as an intermediary between we humans, or let me say the doctors and then the patient. So doctors or nurses would no longer have to test patients to see if they have COVID. Because in the video, we saw the robots doing that. Yeah. The robots are uh, taking samples from people and checking if they have COVID or not. So mm -hmm. after the robot does that, the health practitioners will pick it from there. Sure. So it will definitely reduce doctors and nurses contracting COVID. And then another one is robots most definitely work faster than humans. Mm -hmm. So if we are, we, are, we are looking at a time where robots would be infused into our health systems, then we are definitely going to have more efficient health services in our various hospitals. But for post-COVID, I think robots can be used for quite a number of things. One, they can be used to check our BPs. Robots, uh, robots can take uh, charge of checking vitals of people. Mm -hmm. We all know that is what nurses do. Mm -hmm. So if we have robots doing that, robots, they, they, they take some of the burden of these nurses. Yeah. Therefore, the nurses can now focus on patients who need immediate medical attention. So I think it would go a long way to help us in our health systems. Great. Do you remember what was your view on this one? I think Lydia has said everything, and this is really a great innovation, like a great initiative, looking at how it's going to reduce our doctors and our nurses, you know, with strict contact with patients with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and also easing the stress on them so they can actually um, attend to those with, you know, emergencies mm -hmm. so i think it's good and you know kudos to this um innovation and we yeah. hope you know it materializes exactly. and eases the stress and this straight contact and i am yeah. i am really proud and glad that this innovation is coming from africa you exactly. just came up with this and i'm so much proud <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah, is a, we yeah. are proud of That's africa, yeah. of africa. <laughs> <laughs> well that is all for the news and in wrapping up let's take a quick recap of our headlines Free education for disabled students to be implemented. And again, lack of quality assurance affects employment opportunities. And in our health news, one cup of leafy green vegetable a day lowers risk of heart disease. And also female lawyers more likely to report stress, risky drinking than male lawyers. 
In our tech news, eagerly enhances COVID-19 treatment with robot hospital assistants. Now, thank you very much for staying with AAE TV News as we keep you informed. My name is Lydia Nyame. And I am Jimai Madaladem Duchi. My name is Ajma Chidako. We're glad you had time to watch the AAE TV Midweek News today. Just keep watching our programs on AAE TV and be safe. Have a nice day and bye.